this is Bruce Friedman of Adult Site Broker, and welcome to Adult Site Broker Talk, where each week we interview one of the movers and shakers of the adult industry, and we give you a tip on buying and selling websites. This week we'll be speaking with John, the host of the podcast, What Women Want. ASP Marketplace is the first platform where you can buy and sell adult sites and domains for free. ASP Marketplace allows buyers and sellers the chance to come together on properties that are valued below our company's minimum of $50,000. Don't pay for other marketplaces when ASP Marketplace gives you this service for free. Visit ASBMarketplace.com and sign up as a seller or a buyer today. And of course, there's ASB Cash, the first affiliate program for an adult website brokerage where you can earn as much as 20% of our broker commission referring sellers and buyers to us at Adult Site Broker. Check out ASBCash.com for more details and to sign up. Now let's feature our property of the week that's for sale at Adult Site Broker. We're proud to introduce for sale a hentai site network. The company has an Italian hentai pay site and the most popular Italian hentai free site, plus a popular game pay site. The free site has Italian hentai comics and videos and 52,000 daily views. The adult Italian game site makes over 40,000 euros a month. The hentai comics and video site makes over 11,000 euros monthly. There are also telegram channels for the sites that are included as well as a Patreon page. All of these sites have a ton of content and the traffic is mostly organic. No advertising has been purchased. This is an amazing opportunity for anyone with hentai or game traffic. There is also all the necessary material to learn and manage the business included in the sale. Only 1.5 million euros. Now time for this week's interview. John, thanks for being with us today on Adult Site Broker Talk. It's a pleasure being with you, and uh, it's really interesting talking to somebody who's so far away, although I've been doing some recent podcasts where I've been talking to people over in Great Britain, and when you uh, see ah, them on close. Zoom, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing that the world is allowing us to talk all over the world, aren't they? It's incredible. So we'll tell people about you and your podcast. The What Women Want podcast is a fun and frank discussion about the ways amazing humans from so many walks of life connect with each other and their journeys to become their authentic selves. The show is beginning its second season. John, a.k.a. Hi there, cat suit has been hosting the show since October of 2021. John is an avid writer and contributor on Fet Life. John wrote a column about men and their unsolicited dick pics. Uh, the response led him to brainstorm with nookie notes of dating kinky to create the podcast. John, the host, has an award-winning background in broadcasting going back more than 35 years and has appeared as a talent on national networks as well as regional and local stations. He has seven Emmy Awards for his work behind the scenes. In addition, he's been a public speaker and has even presented a TEDx talk about how people treat each other. In the scene, Hi There Cat Suit is a bottom-leaning switch who is known for his trademark spandex suits, which led to his name. As so many people just said, hi there, cat suit, when he would walk into a party. He's active in the Cincinnati area and is hoping to take the show on the road to kink conventions with live presentations. You can find John on most social media, of course, at hi there, cat suit. So, John, um, so I, you know, we were we were talking briefly before this about our, our common sports. Um, background. Obviously mine pales compared to your experience. <laughs> um, you did a lot. I did. Uh, a lot of it was on national networks doing of mm -hmm. all things professional wrestling, where <laughs> I was a pro wrestling announcer for a long time. I love that. Did uh, division one college basketball, uh, a lot of uh, women's sports, uh, volleyball, swimming, track, soccer. Uh, I would love to do the sports that nobody else wanted to do. And yeah. it was very much something that was a passion of mine because especially women's sports, because the women were 
just as hard, if not twice as hard as the guys did yes. to be amazing athletes. And I wanted to make sure that I honored them yeah. by being able to present their sports in a beautiful spotlight that they mm-hmm. never even dreamed of. Yeah. Women's sports have come a long way, haven't they? Absolutely. And, you know, there's so many underrated sports. Volleyball was my favorite sport to do because you could have people of all shapes and sizes Mm -hmm. doing amazing things out there on the volleyball court. Yeah. And the, the, the hops that these ladies had were just incredible. You know, it's really funny when I, I, I uh, show up at five, five 30 in the morning for my morning beach walk, the place I park invariably there's a group of um, lady boys, as we like to call them, partying. And many mornings they'll be playing volleyball, including this morning in the rain. And uh, yeah, some of them are pretty good. (laughs) It's a wonderful sport and I really enjoyed covering it when I did. Yeah, absolutely. So what made you start a show about what women want when you're a guy? I have always been a proponent of things that are female. I have always been a feminist, so to speak. Yep. I am not a man's man. As a matter of fact, there was a wonderful dominatrix, Amanda Wildfire, say, well, you know, John, you're a man's man. And I had to say, (laughs) well, ma'am, actually I'm not. (laughs) Because there are so many men that are driven strictly by sex. And I, I call them the people that think with their dicks instead of their hearts in their head. Hmm. And I am one of those people who uh, lives a life of kindness, of empathy, and respect. And right. the thing that I noticed with a lot of my kink friends is they weren't getting that kind of treatment yeah. online. And men were se- sending them unsolicited dick pics as a way to say hello, hmm. which I found offensive not only because uh, I am a gentleman who is now single and would like to be able to meet people and the damage that many men have done when it comes to introducing themselves in the wrong way or trying to show a little bit of of male power towards females by intimidating them or Mm -hmm. assuming things that are not appropriate uh, to be the the main thing that they want to do, that keeps those of us who aren't necessarily like that and want to form connections and want to learn about somebody, we don't get trusted. And it really, honest to God, pissed me off. Yeah. And so I did this, this article called Dear Men About Those Unsolicited Dick Picture Sending. (laughs) I I got to read that. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I got a, and it wasn't from you, even though you used to be in the Bay Area. But I used, I got the guy from San Jose saying, "Well, if you're uh, if you're not willing to show yours, you must not be very proud of yours." And I, I I'm think sure I've heard him on. It, I think I've heard him on KNBR, John from San Jose. But go yes, ahead. yes, <laughs> you know exactly the guy I'm talking about. Uh, probably has a uh, Ford F one fifty with the ri- the risers and the big wheels. And, but you know, he's willing to show his dick pic anyway. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I, I always said, joke about that. The guys with the yeah. big, with, with the big wheels normally yeah. have to have tiny peni. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll digress here. Uh, I was down at a roller derby tournament in new Orleans, Louisiana, yeah. and we were in the French quarter on one of the balconies and a guy gets on a motorcycle and just starts revving it up right in the middle of the French quarter amongst <laughs> all the drag Queens and the, yeah. the uh, the fun bars and whatever. Sure. And he, the guy's revving it up. And one of the female derby announcers said, excuse me, sir, would you please put it back in your pants? <laughs> That's hilarious. And that guy drove love, off very oh, I'm quietly. Sure. I'm sure. <laughs> because love, all the drag queens are going, honey, he got you. <laughs> you know, just, I love New Orleans. Oh I love New Orleans. What personality so, that um, town's got. Yeah, go ahead. So I wrote this this article, and he, he was telling me that, you know, I'm ashamed to show mine. I said, look, dude, <laughs> I have a six-foot-three daughter and a son who's a really professional photographer and is amazing. It did its job. I don't have to worry <laughs> about it anymore. What do you have to worry about now? Yeah. 
And he said, well, you, you, you obviously must not be. And I said, I have more women talking to me and saying that they love me than you probably ever will because I actually treat them like humans. Yeah. Yeah. And so this, How about that, it, huh? it, this entire conversation became a conversation that I had with Nookie Notes, who I had met at uh, COPE, which is a kink convention that used to be held here in Ohio. And mm-hmm. we became kindred spirits as far as our writing is concerned. And I had helped her do some video from my television background. And right. she said to me, I really love that article. I said, what is it that women do want, Nookie? Hold on. I think we might have a podcast here. Oh, yeah. So from a kink perspective, I started interviewing people. And I originally thought it was going to be just my friends. But mm-hmm. on my second ever show, I had Christina Carter Nisa Nevers and Adara Jordan, who are arguably three of the biggest fetish models in mm-hmm. the world, yeah, uh, especially Christina Carter, who had formed most of my fantasies in my life when it <laughs> comes to fetish. Right. And so she was on my second ever show. Wow. And when I said to her, Christina, I look at your porn a little bit differently. And she goes, really? I said, I love the outfits you wear. You obviously are voluptuous. You're gorgeous. You have uh, a beautiful face. You're always beautifully made up. And of course, I like your outfits because a guy named Heather Katsu would like spandex outfits. But Hmm. Christina, I get turned on by wanting to be you. And she said, excuse Hmm. me. I said, I get turned on by the idea of being desired and being helpless Hmm. and thinking about what you're thinking about. Interesting. And the feelings you're going through and the mindset that you have, realizing that you're vulnerable and feeling a little bit in danger and not in control of yourself. Hmm. And she went, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that they've watched my porn like that. Hmm. I said, well, consider me the first. That's awesome. Well, that one, that one conversation suddenly open doors to the point where I have no fear of asking people to be on the show. Yeah. None whatsoever. And so I started thinking, who did I want to have on the show? And I kept it with a kink, uh, with a kink focus because we are presented by dating kinky, but I also wanted mm-hmm. to get athletes, um, people who are uh, actresses and the, Strange thing is I started having mainstream porn stars. You have uh, BSG Brian Gross uh, that Mm -hmm. has been on your show. Yep. He approached me with some mainstream porn stars, and it was almost as though they were out of place. Yeah. Because they were so much about the sex. Hmm. And when I would interview people, it wasn't about the sex. It was why they are who they are Mm -hmm. and what allowed them to be that way. I'm sure those were interesting conversations. Yeah. So suddenly I start having people like Midori, who Mm -hmm. literally wrote the book on Shibari and Japanese rope bondage. Yep. And is considered an absolute superstar in the kink world. Sonny Megatron, who had Mm -hmm. a show on Showtime and has one of the biggest podcasts, the American Sex Podcast, in the country. Yeah. And then fetish model after fetish model, and then suddenly pro dom after pro dom to the point now that I have the other week I had Jasmine Wu, who is uh, mm-hmm. considered one of the top pro doms in the United States. And she was doing a presentation on the same platform as I was. And I said, Jasmine, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm John, also known as Hi There Catsuit. I'm the host of uh, What Women and Other Wonderful Humans Want. She goes, I know exactly who you are, Hmm. and I'd love to be on your show. Oh, that's awesome. Hello? (laughs) So life has changed a little bit to the point where now when I ask people to be on the show, they're like, sure, when do we do it? Yeah, either that or they're they're asking to be on the show. Yeah. That's great. I I am just so blessed by the the people that I've gotten to talk to and the stories that I've been able to tell. Mm-hmm. A good example would be Hutsey Hahn, who was very famous for uh, being 
uh, singing at Disneyland during the day and becoming a pro dom at night. Mm. And she became viral when she did the Try Guys show for the Try Guys Do BDSM on YouTube, which is a huge internet sensation. Hmm. And she was the dom that showed them how to do BDSM. Interesting. To the point where she was actually featured on E! in a special called The Real Fifty Shades of Grey. Wow. And they followed her life. That's cool. Well, Hutsey, during COVID, had moved to Ireland to be with a be with her boyfriend took everything moved everything over there and suddenly the relationship ended and she mm. was left with literally nothing man yeah. she returned to colorado where she got a job cleaning houses now you're <laughs> talking about an internationally known pro dom who is cleaning houses in colorado and she shared this story and she said, cleaning houses cleansed my soul and allowed me to remember who I really was. Hmm. And now by going through all that and reaching what could be considered rock bottom, but it, she considered it her transition time. Yeah. She's back performing again. Nice. I think she enjoys kink when she can, but yeah. Her life is about living her authentic life now. It's not about living a life that somebody portrayed her as. Sure, sure. Well, as so it should be. Those are the kind of stories that are pretty amazing. And I'll yep. give you one more because I know we've got some more Please. questions and I don't want to just keep talking here. No, 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 no. Go but, ahead. Because I was going to uh, ask you, I was going to ask you about stories. So go ahead. Uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, I had Lady Vi, hmm. who is known in. Uh, in and around the world, the inf internationally infamous, as she calls herself, hmm. Satanatrix. Okay. And Lady Vi has been a pro dom in Seattle. I actually knew of her work back when I lived in Seattle. And since mm -hmm. I moved around, I've always followed her. Wild, wild personality. And of course, with a name like the hmm. Satanatrix, you would guess that she would have a wild personality. I would guess that. Big wide eyes, amazing grin, and just always up to mischief. I had her scheduled on like my, maybe my eighth show. And mm. we were getting ready to do the show. And I said, can't wait to have you on the show next week. She says, yeah, I'm, I'm heading down to New Orleans uh, to, to do some debauchery. And mm. so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hit you up when I get back. I said, oh, that sounds good. So I contact her when she gets back from new orleans and she says i don't think it's a good time for me to do the show because i can't talk about it Ooh, i said talk about what hmm. it and then i didn't hear anything so i googled her and new orleans and what i found was an article uh -oh. where a catholic priest had hired two dominatrixes oh shit <laughs> to come to a Catholic church to shoot a porn on the altar. Oh, fuck. <laughs> and it was in the middle of the night, middle of the night, you know, early morning. Well, yeah. And a nosy neighbor came by and saw lights on in the church. Oh, God. Peeked in, took the video camera, called the police. Oh, fuck. And Lady Vi and the other uh, dominatrix were charged with a hate crime of institutional vandalism. Oh, wow. Like the same thing you'd be charged for, for putting a swastika on yeah. the side yeah. of a synagogue. Yeah. Synagogue. Yeah. Right. And so obviously I knew what she couldn't talk about. Uh, yeah. And I said to her, your invitation is always open. Yeah. Whenever you want to come on the show, it's always open. And I checked with her three or four times. And I just said, I just want to let you know, I was thinking of you. Yeah. No expectation. Just let me know. And then I got a note back from her saying, I'm finally able to talk about it. And I want to talk about it with you. Cool. And I said, okay, you've got an open forum. I said, mm. I don't want to make that the whole show. Yeah. She yeah. goes, fine. 
but I know what I can say. So <laughs> we opened up the show with the first five, which is five questions about first, like first time you ever picked up a paddle, mm. first time you ever put on a cat suit, first time you ever walked into a dungeon, questions like that. Then we started the second segment, and I said, in the immortal words of Jay Leno, when he talked to Hugh Grant, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> and she went into the story, and I asked a few follow-up questions, and she was able to tell the story of the fact that they weren't in the public eye. Somebody had to look in and consciously try to find something wrong. Right. And that the priest had been the one that had hired them. Yes. And the Catholic Church made it into this PR thing. Oh, of course. Where they went and they went and publicly burned the altar because everything had been defiled. And she said, I understand why they did that. But here's what I don't understand. Why are priests raping kids and I'm the one getting arrested? No shit, huh? And I was like, yep. And she said, we went to shoot a porno that nobody was going to see except people. This guy wanted a custom video, and right. it was the priest that hired us. Yep. And we went down to do it. Yet we're the ones being charged with a crime. Well, of course, because that's that's just the way our industry's treated, unfortunately. So she finished talking about that, and I said, when we come back on the show, we're going to talk about why you are the way you are. Yeah. And we talked for another 40 minutes, and she told me the story of how the Satanatrix started, told me the story of her lifestyle subs and her professional clients, told me the story of the connection that goes on in a scene. And we got deep into the story of how people pass energy and connection and love and touch with each other cool that's very rarely about sex but very much about being in the moment yeah and after the show she said she said john i can't believe we talked about what we talked about this was beautiful yeah and i said well you're a beautiful woman that has a wonderful heart you like to tell people you don't but you're amazing yeah Nice. Her mom listened to the show. Oh, how cool. And I got a note back from Lady Vi saying, my mom listened to the show, and I realized it was the first time she ever heard Lady Vi talk hmm. instead of her daughter. Yeah. And she said, for the first time, I understand why my daughter is the way she is, and I, she's beautiful in every way, and I love her, and I couldn't be prouder. That is fabulous. That is absolutely fabulous. So, so John, and what, that's what I do with my show now, Bruce. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's fabulous. So, what are the things that most men get wrong when approaching someone for a connection? If it is in a social media platform or a dating platform, they don't read the damn profile of the woman. <laughs> they see two breasts, woman. I want to put my dick in it. Hey, babe. <laughs> and they'll send a note that will go, hey, or you're hot, or <laughs> hi, or I, I'm i a dom and I can master you. Jeez. Fall down to your knees to me, bitch. Nice. <laughs> and our show, the reason it made the transition into allowing people to tell stories of their authentic selves is we were a broken record. Yeah. Men... Uh, Men have, I, I call it the, the improv, I give it the improv analogy. You get a problem, you go straight for the solution. Mm -hmm. In this case, the problem is they're horny, the solution is getting themselves off. Yeah. When women get a, get a problem or are given a scenario, mm -hmm. the first thing most women do in improv is they take a 360 degree view of exactly where they are at that moment mm -hmm. and figure out what about the journey is going to make this worthwhile to get me to where I want to go. Yeah. It's a much bigger story. So saying hi or hey, or you're hot, <laughs> or I'm going to do something to you, isn't like saying, 
I read where you really enjoy the a life in submission. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about what that makes you feel. Mm. I happen to be somebody who enjoys being playing from the top mm-hmm. and might have something of interest, especially since we both like the Cincinnati Bengals. Mm. And I love the fact that you love wine at, uh, you you like to drink wine and go to go to parks. That's something that I enjoy as well. As a matter of fact, I actually like to go to the zoo and the concerts. In other words, that sounds like in something. Words, fun. In, other, in other words, talk to them like a human being. Exactly. <laughs> Amazing how that works, huh? Yeah. Amazing how that works. So, how did you get involved with the kink community? Back in 1966. Yes, I am old enough to. <laughs> be back in 1966. I used to watch Batman when it originally came out. Me too. What year were you? What year were you born, John? 63. Oh, you're young. Go ahead. But watching at three years old and seeing Catwoman seducing Batman, or seeing Batgirl getting tied up or put in peril, hmm. that kind of taps on your shoulder. <laughs> To the point when you're watching it in reruns when you're in puberty and your mom and dad haven't given you the talk and suddenly you have an orgasm in your pants while watching Catwoman tie up Batman. And then the second time you have an orgasm, you're watching Emma Peel getting tied to train tracks. (laughs) And the third time you have an orgasm, it's Batgirl. Ah, yes. It came naturally, I guess. And I'm still going, what in the hell is coming out of my penis? What is this? <laughs> because I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. that is your first, second, third, and I will take it all the way up to seventh before I could figure it out, that kind of imprints you. Yeah, no shit, huh? And so <laughs> I had, had the fetish all my life, and somebody actually Obviously. brought up the fact that Kink can be considered an orientation. Hmm. You don't have control over whether you like it or not. Okay. It's imprinted on you at a young age. Mm-hmm. You have a proclivity of it from something that you did not control. Okay. And I tend to agree with that somewhat. This is yeah. not diminishing what people in the LGBTQIA plus spectrum have to go through. Mm-hmm. But I never had a choice in the matter. So I spent right. my first 30 years trying to be normal. <laughs> and I go Quote back unquote. and forth binging and purging. Yeah. You know, I'd buy a whole, I, uh, I got to the point where I uh, really enjoyed the feeling of spandex. I'd buy a spandex outfit. Then I'd throw it away because I want to be normal. And that was the first 30 years of my life. Jeez. Then I got married And she kink shamed me. She said, I don't ever want to see you in that ever. Oh, man. Well, that took care of the next 20 years. So when when my life became one without intimacy and my marriage became something that was not going to work out, I decided to go back to my, my kink and my fetish. Interesting. And eventually was accepted in the Cleveland community. Uh, in a wonderful way to the point where I actually ended up becoming an ambassador of the Cleveland kink community while wow. trying to bring the two rival spaces together to talk to each other. And now yeah. uh, I had a little bit to do with the fact that they will go back and forth between the two spaces for the most part. You know, cool. you have the older people who will always be at the one place and the younger people will always be at the other place, but they intermingle every now and then. That's cool. And so I was the, I was the 56-year-old guy who started at the old place and then went to the young people's place. I said, you're actually kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, that's what brought me into the kink community. And now I'm very much entrenched in the kink community here. And I am proud to tell you that uh, I don't know when this will air, but in March, I am actually being brought out to Chicago, Illinois, to Mm -hmm. be a presenter at Kinky College teaching classes on telling your story authentically. Yeah. One, uh, another one called consent and Mm -hmm. connections, uh, online and beyond. Yeah. And the third one, which I'm most proud of is called kindness in kink. Yeah. 
where you would never think of BDSM where pain and impact and, and sometimes bordering on torture mm. could have kindness in it. <laughs> but that's what I'm going to teach about. Interesting. As far as the schedule goes, we'll discuss, we can discuss that offline. Um, who are some of the best guests you've had on your podcast? You mentioned a few. Yeah. Lady Vi and, and Christina Carter. Um, mm -hmm. Alexandra Snow, who is a legendary dominatrix, uh, was absolutely amazing to talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Weathers, who has a site called Bondage Cafe. Mm -hmm. Probably the preeminent content producer for superheroin and, and, and spandex uh, mm. material. Cool. Legendary guy, published author. I mean, mm -hmm. he, I just got a copy of his book, which uh, he sent to me an autograph for me that has some of the most beautiful pictures of, of women in bondage. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. We talked for three hours. Jeez. He says he doesn't give a lot of interviews, and he talked mm -hmm. to me for three hours. That's awesome. In our first ever two-part interview. Yeah. Um, I have talked to... Uh, Lee Harrington, who is, I don't know if you, you know about Lee, but Lee no. is a pioneer in transgender studies. Okay. And Lee at one time was a female porn star ah. and now is a beautiful transgender man who is one of the best educators in the world when it comes to kink and when it comes to gender issues. It's cool. We've had some non-binary folks on the show that have been mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. We've had Hall yeah. of Fame dominatrixes like Amanda Wildfire, like Mistress Natalie, like Tara Indiana, who ran for president against Donald Trump four years ago because <laughs> she wanted about, to whip I heard about Donald that. Trump. <laughs> yes. Uh, Tara was on the show and we had her on just before election day. I'm sure that got her, Which I'm sure, you sure that got her a few that votes. any better. <laughs> yeah. And then of course Midori is mm -hmm. the is the absolute rock star when it comes to educating people in kink. Mm -hmm. Um she was called by Dan Savage the supernova of kink and she Oh, I love Dan Savage in, in every yeah. Every I've, I've seen him. I, I've seen I've seen him on Bill Maher a bunch of times, and uh, I think he's I think he's hilarious. Mm -hmm. But I've also had fun talking to people who aren't so well known. I think one of my mm -hmm. favorite episodes I had was a friend of mine named Andy, who is a gender fluid sex therapist and uh, actual psychologist <laughs> who has a, an everyday practice that's very open in gender issues and, mm -hmm. and kink issues. And we talked about the way they approach their therapy. And mm -hmm. we talked about a scene that we did, which to this day is still the most intense scene I've ever done, but it did not include one piece of bondage, mm -hmm. one bit of impact. Mm -hmm. It was all mental. Interesting. And to know... It wasn't a mind fuck. It was a, <laughs> here's who you really are. You just have to see it. That's cool. And the catharsis I had after that scene was amazing. I could just list people r one right after the other. I mean, well, Michelle I your, McNichols. I read, who, I read the list. I read the list you put in the materials yeah. you sent me. So there's a lot. There's a lot. There's definitely well, a and, lot. And then I have people like Michelle McNichols, who is the professor of the most popular class at the University of Washington with over 4,500 students coming through it every year hmm. on sex education. Wow. And she came on and talked about the fact that we need to lighten up. <laughs> My gosh, we need yeah. to lighten up. Yeah, no kidding. And the fact that she is the most popular professor isn't just because of sex education, but because she makes it. Like everybody can understand it. There you go. And that's a beautiful thing. Keep it fun. So uh, tell mm -hmm. us about the process of bringing these guests on the show and your reaction once you've interviewed them. As I mentioned, I'm a little fearless when mm -hmm. it comes to asking people. Sure. I will find people that I find interesting on Instagram and I'll follow them for a while. Mm -hmm. And if I think they'll be a good fit on the show, I'll reach out to them. Cool. I will try to find emails wherever possible when I want to get a hold of people. I 
Mm-hmm. Uh, luckily, he had done some things with Sonny Megatron, so I was able mm-hmm. to reach out to Sonny, and and she knew exactly who I was. Midori was our first big get, uh, mm-hmm. I think, as far as absolute superstars, along with Christina Carter. And here's the here's the story I should tell about that. Christina Carter was on my second ever show. Right. I hadn't been on. Mm. And why would Christina Carter, as amazing a fetish model as she is, want to be on my show? And I asked her, I said, Christina, what does your inbox look like? (laughs) She said, you mean the 81,000 unread messages that I have? Wow. I said, well, how the hell did you read mine? She said, well, it's pretty simple. Your email address is women and other wonderful humans at gmail.com. Yeah. And I had to look at that one. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And so and you'll never get a yes unless you actually ask. And there are some people that I have been persistent, not obnoxious, but persistent mm-hmm. with. Right. Alexandra Snow being one of them, who is an amazing mm-hmm. pro dom from here in in Ohio. Mm-hmm. And she said, you've been patient. Let's do the show. Yeah. It took me a year. But the fact is, I always treated her with respect. Right. I always approached her kindly. And that's how you do it. Oh, I agree. Just like guys asking for a date. Yeah. <laughs> do it with respect. Show the proper reverence. Yep. And people will say yes. That's the way people should do everything. Um, do you still have some dream guests you'd like to get on? He laughs. I've I've had a lot of them, which is the funny thing about that. Yes, you have. Yeah. Uh, Simone Justice is one that I am very much wanting to get on. And Mm -hmm. she has told me that this summer we will do it. She is one of the first superstar dominatrices that Mm -hmm. I know of out of Dallas. She's somebody that I desperately want on the show. Cool. Um, there are some fetish models that I would absolutely love to get on the show. One of whom, mm-hmm. of course, is Dee Devantis. Mm. That would be a dream guest on this particular show because I think it would be fascinating to find out how much of Dee Devantis, the character, is the same as the human that plays it. There you go. And so that, I think, if you had a top of the bucket list, that would probably be it right now. But I keep mm-hmm. discovering new people every single day. Jean sure. Bardot, who is a, a amazing pioneer when it comes to both rubber fetish and being a pro dom. Mm-hmm. I had Jean on the show and I gave her five weeks of hype, super doms, uh, super model, everything super I could think of. And I had yeah. her on the show and she couldn't have been nicer. Cool. And cool. when I go to... Uh, when I go to Kinky College, I'm taking a side trip on, uh, up to Minneapolis because I'm going to be fortunate enough to have lunch with Jean Bardot. Cool. That who will be good. the first guest that I've actually met that wasn't one of my friends because this nice. has all been on Zoom. Very good. So I'm hoping to yeah. eventually get to the point where my ultimate dream is to be able to go to a DomCon or a FetCon mm-hmm. and through my basis of being a television host and and talent and also being a talent for live events, I want to be able to be the one that can moderate panels like they do at comic cons and they also do at fetish cons. Yeah. And so that's what my, my ultimate goal is right now Sure, is to be able to go out and experience these people Mm -hmm. and bring my talents uh, out into the public where I can make some great connections. Yes. Or, or like LeBron, bring your talents to uh, Miami. Um, Don't get me started on LeBron. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't resist since you mentioned Cleveland for a while. I I just, I couldn't resist. Sorry. That was, that was one of the worst moments ever on television. I thought, um, what an idiot. Um, how do we, yeah, moderating's good. I've, I've moderated a lot of panels uh, at the uh, adult B2B shows. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's certainly uh, always uh, very gratifying. So how one do we- One of the things, Bruce, pardon me for interrupting, no, no, but one okay. of the things that I love about the interviews that I do mm-hmm. is 
and this sounds like it's a brag, but it's it's going to be a humble oh, brag. brag. I Go don't ahead have and an brag. ego anymore. <laughs> I I got rid of I got rid of my ego, and life became so much better. <laughs> but at the end of most every one of my interviews, the subjects will go, "Well, damn, I didn't expect that," or "That was the most different interview I've ever done," or the one that I love. You didn't ask me the question. I said, what question? You know, where's the strangest place you've done it? And I'm like, I'm not even thinking of that. I don't even give a shit about that. And to have people tell me that this was their favorite interview that they've ever done, that's what I live for. Yeah. Because these women are objectified every single day. And to have them have someone interview them as a human. Mm -hmm. that's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. As everything should be. So how do we find the show? It's very easy. If you know what a link tree is, uh, go to link tree, which they go by L I N K T R. Then you put the dot in there and put an E E and then hit slash what women want podcast. Very good. And that link tree has how you can find us on Spotify, how you can find us on Apple or iHeart or any one of the major podcast places. We are on pretty much all of them and uh, would love for you all to join us. And you can find the show on Twitter at what women want P one. If you're an AJ styles fan, you can remember that one, but uh, what women want P one and then on Instagram, we're at What Women Want Podcast. And how about if they want to be on the show? If they want to be on the show, uh, simply drop me a line, uh, a direct message. I read all my direct messages on Instagram and on uh, and on Twitter. And I think I have ways to get a hold of me. You can get a hold of me through FetLife at Hi There Katsu. Uh, any. Any way you try to get a hold of me, I'm more than happy to say, okay, I need an email from you, and I'll send you all the details on the show, and we start our communication and our connection like that. I, uh, that's uh, that's awesome. So discuss some of the differences, and you've, you mentioned one with the uh, with the gal's mother, but discuss some of the differences you're making in the lives of some of your guests. I think we are allowing them to be seen in a light that they are not used to be seen in. If you think of, let's say, a professional dominatrix, most every reaction to them is, yes, mistress, I want you to, I want <laughs> you to uh, be on top of me, mistress. I want to go on my knees for you. I want to worship your feet. Right. But I'm interviewing the person outside of the latex catsuit. Right, because it's a role. Correct. Now, in some cases, it's very much who they are. Interesting. I have a, um, if you could call this person my, my one crush of anybody that I have had on the show, mm-hmm. uh, their name is Matrix Dominatrix, hmm. a Love it. rubber fetishist and fitness instructor Oh, who inspired me to get back to working out to the point where I work out every day. Cool. And I didn't do that before I interviewed her on the show. So she made a difference in your life. That's right. (laughs) Big time. Yeah. And I will tell a story because it just happened. So we were going to have her back. We were going to have them back on the show and we started talking and they had been through a real health issue Hmm. over the past eight months to the point where they got really sick. Okay. And it took everything they had to be able to get back up and even work or even mm-hmm. work out. Yeah. Lost a lot of weight, became very difficult for them. Mm. And I'm talking about this journey and we go to break because my voice is breaking. I'm starting mm. to sound emotional. Yeah. And We start talking and we're in the break and we just keep talking Yeah, and keep talking. And after about 45 minutes, I said, I feel really bad because I, I really think we need to reschedule the podcast. And she said, I had already decided we were going to, she said, 
or they said gender fluid. And sometimes at 58 yeah. years old, I get it wrong. <laughs> they said to me, they said to me, John, you needed me to talk to you tonight hmm. more than you needed me on a podcast. Interesting. And we finished our conversation and I was in tears and I was able wow. to get myself feeling a little bit better. Yeah. And we rescheduled the podcast, but we also vowed to each other that we would meet up, spend mm -hmm. the day together and nice. get to know each other a lot better. That's cool. So I believe I've made the difference in like Lady Vi's life or in, mm -hmm. in uh, Hutsey Brook, formerly known as Hutsey Hahn's life. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to present people in ways that they've never been presented before. But right. The people. I get a tremendous love out of it. And I, I feel the connection that I have with many of these people. Now, right. I will also tell you, it can be a curse as well. <laughs> because when you've done almost 100 shows talking about everything like the feeling that you would have inside a vacuum, latex vacuum bed and the peace you can find inside it, or some sort of uh, some sort of session that is done where you're at total peace with yourself and it lasts for hours. And you talk about this and you sit back and you go, am I ever going to get to experience it? Hmm. And that can be tough yeah. because I'm talking about things that I dream of. Wow. So I don't know if I'm torturing myself when I do that hmm. or if I just want them to be able to share the story. Sure, sure. And I'm hoping that somewhere along the lines, because many of the people I talk to are professional dominatrixes, it's not proper for me to say, hey, I had you on the show. Why don't you do this with me? Because it's their vocation. It is yes. their job. Yes. It's not like something asking, I can it's afford like, it's on like a asking, regular basis. Yeah, it's like asking a doctor to treat you for free. That that doesn't work. Right. Yeah, I agree. So but I will tell you that the, many ahead. of them have just told me th that just to to hang in there and keep believing and that I will be able to enjoy the experiences because I'm mm -hmm. paying it forward. Yeah, yeah. And one day I, I hope I will. Uh, you are, most certainly. So when you're presenting at a kink convention, what kind of classes do you teach? Well, I talked about the three classes that I'm going to present, and the oh, that's, one I'll yes. talk about here yes. is uh, kindness and kink. Yes. One of the things that I have noticed with many of my friends is that many of the top, and this comes to me both male and female, mm -hmm. is many of the tops will be very set in their ways about wanting to do one kind of scene, and a mm -hmm. lot of it is very intense. And some of it can be nice, but it's usually very intense or, or trying to bring focus to right. something. Right. Well, I have developed this way of topping in the few times that the toppy cat suit, that's a hashtag toppy cat suit because it's a thing. <laughs> very rarely does toppy cat suit ever come out to play. Okay. But when I do, I will do scenes that people will say to me afterwards, I've never been treated that kindly before. Hmm. Doesn't mean that I didn't hit them with a paddle. It doesn't mean that I didn't hit them with a soup ladle, which happens to be my favorite toy from a dollar store and it leaves wonderful <laughs> bruises. <laughs> but what they feel is what I say to them in between. I'm hitting you with this ladle over and over in this one spot. So when you get to the office on Wednesday, and you're having a really crappy time and you're all stressed out, you can reach down and touch that bruise and come right back to where we are now. Nice. Or I will, if they've had a really rough week and, and let's say they, they might not feel good about their body image, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do a series of impact moves and then I'll go to them and I said, you do realize that you're absolutely beautiful in the way you're responding to this. Hmm. Nice. Instead of you should, you should be happy and count these off for me. Yeah. No, that's not what I ask. Yeah. And the biggest example I can give is a scene that was done 
at Winter Wickedness, where a friend of mine who had had a really rough time getting back into the kink scene, had a bad relationship, bad breakup, mm-hmm. and had gained about 40 pounds, wasn't happy with the body image at all. A friend of mine said, I want to do a scene with her and I want you to co-top. And I said, I don't want to co-top, but here's what I want to do. I want to provide her with something to really remember the scene by. Okay. And make her feel the way she wants to feel. So the top tied her up with her arms to the side, blindfolded her, and did an impact scene. Okay. And between the impacts, I had gathered her friends and we whispered into her ear things like, your beauty comes from your heart and your heart is the most beautiful thing in this building. Nice. You give so much to so many others that all we ever want to do is give back to you. That's awesome. Say quote mm-hmm. after quote, yeah. saying yeah. after yeah. saying. Yeah. In between these hard impacts. Yeah. Interesting. At the end of the scene, they take off her blindfold and I'm standing in front of her holding a small, I think it's three by five notebook. Hmm. And we had all written what we had said to her in that notebook. Oh, that's sweet. And what we said is, this is a notebook to remind you of where you were tonight. Yeah. And when you have a doubt as to the difference you make in our lives, Open it up, read it, Mm -hmm. and remember. And that, my friend, I guess is what women want. Exactly. (laughs) Well, John, on that note, I'd like to thank you for being our guest today on Adult Site Broker Talk, and I know we'll have a chance to do this again soon. I absolutely enjoyed every minute, Bruce. Thank you very much for being so persistent, but (laughs) never rude. (laughs) I do my best. Thank you, sir. My broker tip today is part five of how to buy an adult website. Last week, we talked about how to determine the value of a site, how to negotiate the sale, and how to get to the point of drawing up an agreement. So now you're talking to your attorney and you're having them draft an agreement. What should be in it? Well, your attorney will guide you through the legal side, but here are some considerations to keep in mind from a buying standpoint. What is the date you'd like to close? Make sure you know that you'll have the money to either pay the deposit or the entire amount of the purchase by that date. I've had buyers who aren't ready, and that just causes issues. In fact, I'm going through some of that right now with a couple of my deals. Make sure that all of the assets you're purchasing are in that agreement, such as every domain included in the sale, processing and payment accounts, relationships with vendors, all records including 2257 data, software to run the sites, and any other assets such as source code for the sites. Of course, it should spell out any payment schedule if there is one. Who's responsible for closing costs, such as paying for escrow? And there are always terms that are unique to yours and the seller's situation. This assumes you're the party responsible for drawing up the agreement. If the seller is drawing up the agreement, then it's important that you express all of this to your legal representative so they can check the seller's agreement and see if any changes are necessary. We'll talk about this subject more next week. And next week, we'll be speaking with Norman Jean of Junk Productions. And that's it for this week's Adult Site Broker Talk. I'd once again like to thank my guest, John, of What Women Want. Talk to you again next week on Adult Site Broker Talk. I'm Bruce Friedman.